Hello, everyone. Welcome to Monday's Read Aloud. <clears throat> so if you remember, on Friday, we read that, um, well, we read a few things. They went back to the bridge, and Arul and Mutu had brought food for the girls, and they kind of laid it out and had a dinner. And they had also brought a tarp for the girls and um, gave it to them to make a shelter. So I think we're really learning about what kind of people that rule in uh, Mutu are. And then let me just show you here. Um, so yeah, like this is a tarp, you know, you've seen that, right? It's just like a plastic sheet kind of. And so they prop, yeah, and like, look, clearly not this like organized, but they're using the tarp to make some sort of shelter. And so that's on the bridge. And then they probably put their stuff under there and sleep under there, just so you can kind of picture it. Um, also, I wanted to just show you, I had showed you a little bit of this in school. Um, but Chennai, India is a place of great wealth. There's a lot of people with a lot of money there. It's on the coast. A lot of people visit there as tourists, but it's also a place of great poverty and there's a lot of homeless. So let's just quickly look at some of these images. You can see people on the street. They're selling things. Here it looks like maybe they're under some sort of bridge as their shelter. Okay. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a picture of what we're dealing with here. Here, this these people have their belongings under a tarp. Okay. All right. So to chapter 13 called Work and Pray. That morning, after we'd combed out our hair, our comb, I offered our comb to the boys. If you'd like, I said, hesitantly, not wanting to offend them. You can use this. Mutu snickered. <laughs> Next, you'll try to make us iron our clothes. Thanks. Arul stuck the comb in his tangled hair and yanked. Months since I did this. Months, really? Mutu said. Aka would have never guessed that just by looking at your... Oh, sorry. Just by looking at your... Hair, boss. And the comb snapped in two. So his hair was so gnarled and went kuk, kuk. Talk! You imitated the sound of the comb breaking and clapped your hands. Talk, talk, talk. Sorry, a rule said, tugging at the piece left in his hair. It stuck up at a jaunty angle, refusing to come out. Why are you sorry, boss? Mutu peeled with laughter. You just made two combs out of their one. Never mind, I said. Here, let me help. I pulled out the stubborn piece of comb, along with the chunk of Arul's hair. He helped me. He hel yelped and rubbed his head. Oh, but continued apologizing. I feel bad. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? There is something you can do, I said. You can promise to eat your share of food every night. What do you care how much I eat? Adrul asked. I don't care. It's just that if you eat your fair share, then I won't have to feel guilty about it either. You made me feel like a greedy pig last night. Adrul grinned. It's silly to skip meals, I said. 
How are you going to live a nice long life if you don't eat properly? What's the point of living longer? Well, what's the point of dying sooner? I said. I don't go, mind going off to meet our Father, who art in heaven, as soon as I can, Adrul said. Our Father, who art in heaven. Oh, you said that last night. Your Father is dead? Yes, said Arul. But I wasn't praying to my Father, he said. I was praying to God. He's called our father. God's our mother, too, I said. Only if you're Hindu, he said. Hindus have a million names for God, but all are wrong, because Hindus worship the wrong gods. I've never heard anyone say there's a right name or a wrong name, let alone a right God or a wrong God, I said. Anyway, it doesn't matter to me because I don't pray. You really never pray? Adarul looked horrified. Even the wrong gods are better than no god. My mother must have prayed a million times, I said, for our father to be better to us, but he only got worse. He always hit her, and then one night he beat us, so we ran away. I cast a glance at you wondering if it would upset you to hear me talking about Appa. But you and Mutu were busy combing Kuti's scanty fur with one of the pieces of comb. What about you? My family died, Adarul said. I'm so sorry, I told him. Don't worry. Christians go to heaven when they die. What do Christians do when they're alive? I said, sensing he didn't want to dwell on the subject of his family's death. I had a vague idea that being Christian had something to do with worshipping Yesu, a god who wore a crown of thorns. Adarul started explaining all about Yesu and about doing what a book called the Bible says to do. Mutu joined us when Arul was telling me that Yesu said that if someone whacks you on one cheek, you should show them the other cheek. And if you do the things Mutu, if you do the things Yesu says to do, Mutu added, you sprout wings when you get to heaven so you can zoom about like an airplane. You're a Christian too? I asked Mutu. Mm, I don't know. Mutu scratched his chin. You are, Adarul said. You repeated those words I told you to, remember? Yes, yes, Mutu said. But those are just words, and you told me to say them, boss, so I said them. But there's lots that I don't really understand. Like what? Adarul demanded. Like that show in the other cheek thing. And like, why didn't Yesu fight the bad guys? Mutu continued. He had 12 in his gang. Not a gang, Arul said. Followers. Gangs follow the boss, Mutu Arani. So gangs are followers. Yesu had apostles, Arul corrected him. Teachers who spread his word. Stop talking nonsense, Mutu. You should know better. Okay, okay, boss. I'll just turn around and show my other side. Matu whip, Mutu whipped about and wiggled his bottom at us. <laughs> Adarul looked at the sky and moaned uh, about how he didn't want our souls to burn in hell until the end of eternity. If I hadn't been laughing so hard, I'd have asked the rule how eternity could have an end. We're running late, Mutu glanced at an imaginary wristwatch. Need to get to the office, boss. Want to come with us? Adarul asked as he gathered the sacks and sticks they'd been carrying the day the day we first met. Yes, thanks. But we, we really need a job, I said. Where do you work? We are adventurers, Mutu said. We climb 
mountains every day. Right, boss? Right, Edward said. Although some days we swim across rivers instead. What do I need to bring? I said. Don't worry. We'll find what you need, Arul said. Ruku will bring beads. You patted your bead bag. Good idea, he grinned at you. Good, you agreed. Kuti trotted along as we followed Arul across the bridge to the side we hadn't explored yet. It led to a crowded street where cars honked and bicycle bells trilled and motorbikes and auto rickshaws spewed trails of smoke. A van lurched by with school children in uniform hanging out the windows. One day, we'll go to school again, Ruku, just like those kids. School, Mutu guffawed like I'd been joking. You actually like school? Not exactly, I admitted, thinking of the kids who teased us and the teachers who ignored us. Not all the time, but there was one teacher I loved, and she said... I paused, thinking of all the wonderful things she had said about my imagination and how smart I was, and how she'd encouraged us both. I realized the biggest gift she'd given me wasn't the book. It was something else. Her gift was that she believed in me and Ruku. Believed what? Mutu said. She said if we work hard. I tried adopting Parvati teacher's persuasive tone. We can do anything when we grow up. I used to go to school when I lived in my village. Adarul sounded wistful. And I had a great teacher too. Don't set, sound so sad, boss, Mutu said. We can do anything we want now, even though we aren't going to school. In fact, we can do anything we feel like because we don't have any school teacher telling us what to do. We turned onto a street full of wooden stalls. At one stall, flies swarmed up from an open gutter onto the skin carcasses of goats. You held your nose. Oh, that's a bad smell, Mutu cackled. Wait till you get where we're going. <laughs> hmm, I wonder where they're going. I couldn't imagine what could be worse than this smell. I remembered reading an article about a man who cleaned sewers on an oily bit of newspaper in which Appa had wrapped pakoras to surprise us with one of his on one of his good days. Surely. Hopefully, we weren't going to clean sewers. Finally, we stopped in front of a shack that had a peeling sign hanging above the open door. Victory Waste Mart. Kuti should wait outside, Arul said. Sit. You and Kuti and Mutu sat on the steps while I ducked into the shack after Arul. Towers of junk, paper, plastic, glass, and metal were stacked everywhere. A man was holding up a pair of rusty scales, weighing some cardboard. One sack, please, sir, Utterul asked. The man's eyes fell on me. They were mean, like a rogue elephant's. What's your name, pretty girl? the man asked. I pretended I hadn't heard. Figuring the less he knew about us, the better. You won't tell me your name, but you want my help? Fiji, I mumbled. New to the city? Where do you live? Not sure, I said. He motioned. To, toward a pile of crumpled jute sacks lying in a corner. I took one and Arul picked out a stick. Thank you, sir, Arul called over his shoulder. We stepped out of the cluttered shack into the dazzling sunshine. Arul shot me a concerned look. You probably want to wait outside with Ruku and Kuti from now on. 
Yes, I said. Grateful he had understood that the waste man scared me. We cut through an empty park and passed some teetering apartment buildings that at least offered us some shade from the blazing sun. Huge posters as tall as we were, advertising the latest movies, were plastered on the walls. We followed a rule to a flat open field where there was no escape from the sunshine. She you wrinkled your nose. Not far away was the largest garbage heap I had ever seen. Mounds and mounds of junk and waste stretched out like a mountain range. The fragrance of wilted jasmine flowers mingled with the smell of goat droppings and every other bad smell imaginable. Welcome to the Himalayas of the rubbish, Mutu said with a dramatic flourish. Welcome. Um, I just wanted to talk about what Adarul was saying. He um, was saying that they were the at the Himalayas of rubbish, which is garbage. So here are the Himalayas, right? They're famous mountains. They're gigantic. And what they're doing is they're at a trash mountain. Um, we don't know what they're going to do, but these are actual mounds of garbage in Chennai. So you can see them. You can see the city in the background. You see that kid in the mound, the mountain. So that's what they mean by the Himalayas of rubbish. They're in a garbage mountain. Okay, so only one chapter today because it was a longer one. Um, and Today's question is, I'm asking you to connect what's happening in the bridge home to human rights. Okay, so you're connecting it to the human rights. Um, the question is, how does the bridge home connect with what we learned about human rights? Are there rights that are not protected? And I want you to pick one right and connect it to the bridge home. So I'm going to show you an example. I've posted the Declaration of Human Rights for you again. And I want you to look through it and just pick one right and describe how that connects to the bridge home so far. So, you know, Here's a great one. We all have the right to a good life with enough food, clothing, housing, health care. Great one. We have the right to an education. All of these things are great for this. I'm going to choose um, number five. Nobody has any right to hurt us. Okay. So that's my right. And now I'm going to explain how it connects to the bridge home. Here's my response. Right five in the Declaration of Human Rights says that no one has the right to hurt us. I think this connects to the bridge home because the girls were being hurt by Appa. For example, he came home one night and hit VG in the face and threw something at Ruku. This shows that the girls were not being protected. Further, this stresses them out so much that they felt they needed to run away from home. This is why people should be protected from being hurt. Okay, so that's all you're doing. You're ex connecting the book we're reading to the human rights we have read before. Okay, and you'll put this um, in the comment section below, and I can't wait to read what you say. And you'll notice next to the video, I posted the Declaration of Human Rights. All right, so have a great Monday and good luck.